Hello people from the future, welcome to Normalize Nerd. In this video, I'm gonna talk about Bayesian classifiers and I'm gonna explain how knife based classifier works. And today I'm very excited because this is the first time I'm creating a video using Manim. Yes, it's the famous mathematical visualizer library created by one of my favorite YouTubers named Grant Sanderson. So let's get started. First of all, let's define our classification problem. Well, it says that you will be given a set of features denoted by x which contains the elements x1, x2 up to xn. That means we have n number of features. And given that, we need to find the correct label that is represented by y. Now, to tackle this problem from a probabilistic view, we need to consider this y and x as random variables. Let's assume that capital Y takes the value lowercase y and capital X takes the value x1, x2 up to lowercase n. Now to find the correct label, we need to find this expression for all possible values of y. Well, this expression is actually a conditional probability, which simply means the probability of capital Y is equal to lowercase y given that capital X is equal to this set. To be more precise, we need to find the particular value of lowercase y for which this conditional probability becomes maximum. Why? Because in that case, we will be able to say that, okay, for this particular value of y, the expression becomes maximum. So the class label should be this. But the problem is, it is hard to find the probability of y given x directly. To tackle this problem, we use Bayes' theorem. Yes, this is the portion where Bayes comes into the play. This is the Bayes' theorem. It says that the probability of y given x that we want to find is same as the probability of x given y times probability of y divided by probability of x. Now, everything that you can see in the right hand side of this equation can be found from our data set. Let me first tell you how we name these terms. The thing in the left hand side that we want to find is called as posterior and the thing in the right hand side probability of y is called as prior. Why this kind of name? Well prior means the probability corresponding to an event before considering any evidence and posterior means the probability of that event after considering some evidence. Well the evidence is nothing but the set of features. So the probability of x is called as evidence here because x is just a set of features, right? And the term probability of x given y is named as likelihood. Now here's an interesting thing. The value of the denominator stays the same regardless of the value of y we put in in the numerator, which simply means to compare the value of this conditional probability for different class labels, we can just ignore the denominator because the evidence remains the same. To really understand the concept, we need to go through an example. Let's consider this small data set. You can see that we have two features, x1 and x2, and the level variable is y. x1 and x2 can take values from 0, 1, or 2. That means both x1 and x2 are categorical variables. Well, I will talk about continuous variable later in the video. And y can take two values, 0 or 1, so essentially, it's just binary classification. Now imagine that someone is asking us to estimate the value of y given that x is equal to 0, 2. That means somebody has given the value of x1 and x2 that are 0 and 2 and they want us to find the correct label for that set of feature. Okay, let's compute the value of the conditional probabilities for both the labels, that is y is equal to 0 and y is equal to 1. First of all, I'm going to compute the prior. That means probability of y is equal to 0 and the probability of y is equal to 1. So the formula is very simple. In the numerator, I'm going to write the frequency of y is equal to 0 and in the denominator, I have to write the total number of occurrences. Now look at the data set. Well, here I have 6 occurrences of y is equal to 0 and 4 occurrences of y is equal to 1. So the value of p y is equal to 0 will be 6 upon 10. Now to calculate the probability of y is equal to 1, we just need to replace the numerator with the frequency of y is equal to 1. 
and this is going to be 4 upon 10. Okay, so we have got our priors ready. Now let's compute the likelihoods. First, I'm going to compute the probability of x given y is equal to 1. We just need to look at all the rows where the value of y is 1 and the feature combination is 0, 2. So you can see we have got only one such entry in our data set. So the value of this expression will be 1 upon 4. Similarly, let's calculate the likelihood for y is equal to 0. And you will see that in our data set, there is not a single occurrence where the value of y is 0 and the feature combination is 0, 2. So the value of this likelihood is 0. Now to find the class level that maximizes the posterior probability, we just need to compute the numerator that I showed earlier. So the way to do this is just by multiplying likelihood with prior. After computing, we see that for the class level 0, the value of the numerator is 0. And for the class level 1, the value is 1 upon 10. So obviously, the class level 1 maximizes our posterior probability. Okay, so we got an answer. So we should be fine with that, right? Well, no. There is a huge problem with this method. The problem is, it is hard to find that particular combination of x1 and x2 in our data set. As you can see that we only find one occurrence of the instance where y is equal to 1 and x1 was 0 and x2 was 2. And we didn't find a single occurrence where y is equal to 0 and x1 is equal to 0 and x2 is equal to 2. And this is only for two features. Suppose we have 50 features. So just imagine how hard it will be to find that particular combination of 50 features in our data set. It is very likely that we will never encounter some particular combination of features, right? And if we don't find even a single occurrence of multiple such combinations, then the probability value will always be zero. And we can't really compare if we have multiple zero values, right? So to tackle this problem, we use naive base classifier. Well, the concept is very simple. We just need to consider that x1 and x2 are independent of each other. Now, why this can help? Well, if we just consider that x1 and x2 are independent of each other, then we don't need to actually find that particular combination of x1 and x2 in our data set. We can just write the probability of x given y as a product. Let me show you. Please understand that we wouldn't be able to write this if the features are not independent. So that's the big assumption that knife base makes. To be honest, in real worlds, the features might not be actually independent. That's why it's called a naive approach towards the problem. But it makes our work easier and it produces really good results. So let's first compute the probability of x1 is equal to 0 given y is equal to 1. Well, to do this, we just need to count the entries where y is equal to 1 and x1 is equal to 0. So as you can see, there are three such cases and the number of occurrences where y is equal to 1 is 4. So the probability will be 3 upon 4. Similarly, if we calculate the probability of x2 is equal to 2 given y is equal to 1, we will get 2 upon 4. Now let's come to the next line. So here first we need to find how many times the value of x1 is equal to 0 where y is equal to 0. So it turns out there is only one occurrence and the number of cases where y is equal to 0 is 6. So the probability becomes 1 upon 6. Similarly, if we calculate the number of cases where x2 is equal to 2 and y is equal to 0 is 1. So here also I'm going to have 1 upon 6. Now let's compare them. So obviously the first probability is greater than the second one. So we can clearly see that the class level one maximizes our posterior probability. So the estimated class level is one. And voila, now you know how knife base works. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about how you can deal with continuous features. So until now, we were dealing with categorical variables, right? X1 and X2 were both categorical. And in that case, we could actually compute the frequencies. But in case of continuous features, we can't compute the frequencies, right? So how to tackle this? Well, there are many ways. I'm going to discuss two ways. The first one is 
discretization. Suppose there's a continuous variable named age and let's consider that the value of age lies between 11 and 50. Now we can actually divide the whole range into several groups such that the continuous variable becomes a categorical one. For example, let's divide it into four groups and we can interpret these like 1 corresponds to the age group between 11 and 20, 2 corresponds to the age group between 21 to 30 and so on, right? And the second method is to fit a known distribution to our features. This distribution can be a normal distribution, a Poisson distribution according to the need of the data. But how does this fix the problem? Well, the thing is, when we have a known distribution, we know its probability function. So to calculate the value of probability of x given y is equal to some label, we can just use the probability density function of the known distribution. Here, f denotes the PDF of a known distribution. And the product sign at the beginning tells you that here also I am considering the features to be independent of each other because only then we can multiply the probabilities. And that's how we deal with the continuous features. So that was all for this video guys. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and learned something new about Bayesian classifiers. If you like this video, please share this video and subscribe this channel. And do comment if you like this 3 blue 1 brown format video. Stay safe and thanks for watching.